Uh, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, just a few things uh, to uh, call to your attention. Uh, first of all, next Sunday is our outdoor lift worship at Birchard Park. Um, this is uh, an all lift um, uh, gathering. Uh, so we encourage you uh, to attend that. We are going to keep this service. We're going to pare it down. We're going to shorten it uh, a little bit so that uh, we can, I and uh, the Marine and I can get to the park after that service because uh, activity will start there at 10 o'clock with some pastries and some refreshments, uh, fellowship time, uh, and then the service at 10.30, and then we're going to do a brief uh, kind of walk through the park and pick up some whatever uh, needs to be picked up there and to be tossed away, uh, a little, just a miniature service project. So that's going to be uh, next Sunday. I encourage, uh, I encourage you to, to, um, uh, to go to that. We're going to be joined by uh, St. John's and... Uh, Hayes United Methodist is, uh, they're sending their whole congregation over there because uh, Pastor Josh is on vacation. Uh, St. Uh, Mark will be there. Uh, uh, just an all lift um, 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 gathering here uh, that I encourage you uh, to attend. Um, a reminder about our ELW campaign. There's a, there's a, a, a um, a flyer in your bulletin about that. Uh, I don't know exactly how far, I think we're about a third of the way along of where we need to be on that. So I encourage you to take a look at that and consider uh, sponsoring one or more um, of those hymnals for that campaign. Um, and then also a reminder about it, we have the yellow and green or green cards in the bulletin, our welcome cards. We like you to fill those out and drop those in the offering plate um, uh, when that comes by later in the service. Uh, today, Jerry Moses is here, and he's going to give us an update on some of our um, construction uh, and our renovation pro uh, projects. So I'm going to call on Jerry, and she's, he's going to fill us in on that. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? I'm always funny talking in front of a mic. Uh, just going to talk a few minutes about a uh, couple items that we, four years ago, voted on as a congregation. And thanks to all of your generous donations to the capital campaign, we are able to move ahead with one of the uh, top projects that was on the list. At the uh, front of the church in the narthex, there's a uh, diagram of the restroom renovation. Uh, we've been working on it for about six months, getting everything together. And uh, in addition, the preschool obtained a grant they were able to contribute to this project as well. The uh, restrooms down in the dining room and off the preschool, uh, if you've been down there recently, they're in dire need of renovation. And uh, the 31st of this month, Zimmerman Construction is going to start tearing things apart and uh, we're going to basically update everything so it'll look similar to what the restrooms in the Sunday school wing are like. In addition to that, the coat closet in the back of the church uh, across the hall from the existing bathroom is going to become a men's and women's restroom. So when we have our large events here, we don't have to funnel everybody down the hallway to the Sunday school room. The existing restroom is going to become a family friendly restroom and the uh, time frame for that we're looking at uh, mid-september they're going to have the downstairs uh, hopefully done for the preschool kids and then probably late fall for the upstairs restrooms here in addition to the restroom project uh, grace is going to get a digital sign our existing sign in the parking lot is going to be retrofit with an LED so Linda can share with the community all the things that are going on at Grace Lutheran Church. And uh, that will be September, mid-September, they're supposed to be erecting this design. So, like I said, uh, thank you for all your generous donations to the capital campaign and uh, good things moving forward. Thanks.
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jerry, uh, for all the work that uh, you and uh, uh, committee and council members have been doing. It's, uh, it's a big responsibility and lots, lots to think about there and plan for, and uh, uh, so certainly uh, deserves our applause and our thanks and our gratitude uh, for uh, their leadership uh, in this regard. We begin worship today with confession and forgiveness and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. We sing the gathering hymn number 362.
The grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your, for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A first reading this day from the 44th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare it and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. Word of God. Word of life. A second reading written in the eighth chapter of Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we, uh, while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Word of God, word of life. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. I need a helper this morning. Anybody want to help me? We're going on a mission. We got some weeds to get out of here. Come on. Be my helper. <coughs> so, how many of you have ever helped your parents? Maybe um, you get the weeds, I'm going to spray them, okay? You ever helped your mom and dad in the garden? I ever hear mom and dad talk about the weeds? Every good garden's enemy is a weed, right? Well, in our story today, Jesus compares his church to a garden infested with weeds. Sometimes people in church can say mean and hurtful things. But Jesus says that we have to be careful about removing those weeds from the church because it could do more harm than it could do good. And he says we should concentrate on tending to the good fruit and leave those weeds to God. So rather than nitpicking about all the wrong things somebody else has done, we should focus on the positive things and leave all that bad judgment of those negative things, leave all that to God. Can we try and do that? I invite you to join me in prayer and the congregation may follow along. Dear God, help us to love one another and leave the matter of judgment in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. 
but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts to hear your word and to respond in faith. We pray this in your name. Amen. Pulling weeds, uh, it's one of those uh, never-ending jobs, right? Have you ever had a garden? Or even if all you have is a lawn, you know that weeds are a constant reality or threat. Now, growing up in Minnesota with farmland all around, I had many opportunities to pull weeds on a grand scale. One summer when I was in my early teens, I was employed by a local farmer who also happened to be my scoutmaster. And the job was to pull weeds in his cornfields. And we spent a good week walking through his fields, pulling mostly sunflowers. And sometimes the pulling was easy and we could cover three or four rows on either side. But in some of the lower areas of the field where the water had carried and deposited the sunflower seeds, the sunflowers were thick. And we would just work on the row of corn to the left or right and sometimes spend a half an hour or more to just get through one row. Payback then was pretty good, 50 cents an hour. I had another opportunity to be a weed puller several years later. It was the summer after my first year in seminary. I was living at home with my parents. My cousin was a farmer and needed help with weeding his bean fields. But this was a bit easier work than walking the cornfields for my scoutmaster. My cousin had taken his, one of his tractors and bolted a 12-foot wooden beam crossways to the underside of the hydraulic scoop on the front. And to this wooden beam, he had bolted three old school bus seats, one in the middle and then one on each end of this beam. And then three of us then sat on those seats each of us armed with a pump spray bottle, very much like this one, except it was a little bigger. And those bottles had this new miracle chemical called Roundup. And my other cousin drove the tractor through the bean fields, and I, along with his brother and sister, were sitting there in those bus seats with our spray bottles spraying the weeds that we came upon with the Roundup. And those weeds were mostly thistles that I remember. Now today there are much more sophisticated means of applying weed killer wherever it is needed, whether in our fields or in our lawns, but the problem and the question is still the same. What do we do with the weeds? Now Jesus uses the image of weed pulling in our gospel text for today because the problem of weeds was as much a reality for those in biblical times as it is today. In last Sunday's text, Jesus talks about planting seeds and the different kinds of soil that is needed for plants to grow, and Maureen preached on that lesson last weekend. 
And in today's text, Jesus continues to use the agricultural metaphor as he speaks about weeds and weed pulling. So what is Jesus trying to teach us? And what can we learn from this parable about pulling weeds? We learn, first of all, that there is always a hostile power in the world that is seeking and waiting to destroy and undo what God has created and done. When the seeds are planted and the weeds begin to appear, appear, the servants ask, well, where do the weeds come from? And the master replied, an enemy has done this. In the time of Jesus, it was a common crime for a person to go and scatter weed seeds in someone's field. And it was a serious crime because fields and crops were the source of a person's livelihood. But apparently someone had little regard for this farmer or just wanted to cause havoc. And has anything changed since? Are people any less sinful today than they were in Bible times? Life is a bewildering mixture of wheat and weeds, of good and evil. It seems that no matter how good something may seem to be, there is something or someone that is working against it to do evil. Now, one of the largest and most helpful government programs that has ever been devised is Medicare. Think of the millions of people that have benefited from this program. My own parents benefited hugely from this program. When my dad had a stroke and had to be hospitalized for a long period of time, Medicare paid most of the bill. When my mom needed her hip replaced at age 75, Medicare paid. At age 80, she had heart bypass and later received a pacemaker at age 85. Again, Medicare paid the bill. As she neared 90, Medicare paid for surgery for her eye. For all the good this program does, there are many, many people who rip Medicare off for billions of dollars. In February of this year, 23 Michigan residents were charged for their alleged involvement in two illegal schemes to defraud Medicare of more than $61.5 million by paying kickbacks and bribes and billing Medicare for unnecessary medical services that were never provided. Something that was meant to be good gets infected with evil to the extent, extent that the very existence of the good is put at serious risk. Life is a bewildering mixture of wheat and weeds, of good and evil. The story is told about a woman who was shopping and picked up some grapes. Now, These are my husband's favorites, she told the produce manager. Have they been sprayed with poison? And without looking up, the producer manager, the produce manager said, no, you'll have to get that yourself at the drugstore. In today's world, that kind of joke, it seems funny, but it really isn't funny anymore because there are some people who will actually do it. Last month, a Utah woman was arraigned on charges accusing her of killing her husband by poisoning him with a spiked drink with fentanyl and then trying to collect a multi-million dollar life insurance payout. Life is a bewildering mixture of wheat and weeds, of good and evil. That seems to be the first truth that Jesus is telling us in this parable about pulling weeds. But that leads us to a second truth or teaching in this parable, and it centers around what God wants us to do about the reality of evil in the world and in our lives. And the truth that the parable teaches is this, pulling the weeds can destroy both the good and the bad. The servants in the parable had their own idea of how to solve the problem. Their solution was this, concentrate on the evil, search out the weeds and get rid of them. They asked the owner, do you want us to go out and gather up the weeds? I can see them saying that with a little bit of enthusiasm, maybe even some excitement. The servant's solution on the surface seems simple and promises immediate results. Find the weeds, get rid of them. Weed pulling has always had its fascination for some Christians. All of us have done it. Some are better and more practiced at it than others. And a few specialize in it. 
Jesus never practiced it nor recommended this method, but we must confess it has appeal for all of us. Weed pulling comes by different names today, but it can be any method we use to judge or condemn someone else. It's the snide suggestion that if people do not believe or practice their faith or live their lives the way we do, then they are not true Christians. Ed Marquardt, an ELCA pastor who has written and taught extensively regarding evangelism, puts it this way in his book, Weeds and Wheat. He says, when I was a young man during my seminary days of training to become a pastor, my ideal congregation was the Church of Our Saviors in Washington, D.C. Among my peers and friends, that congregation was the ideal, the inspiration, the model to which we aspired. It was a small congregation of 200 people who renewed their spiritual vows each year. Their vows were to tithe, to attend Bible study every week, to pray every day, to be politically active for the poor every week. And they signed on the dotted line every year. These people were committed. That was my ideal community in those younger years. But not anymore. Maybe I have matured, but now I want a community that is wide open to all people, including the uncommitted, the half-committed, the lukewarm, the confused, the puzzled, the materialist, the messed up, the addicted, the afflicted. We are all welcome here. We want weeds and wheat in our church. And besides, I am no longer sure which is which and who is who as I used to be as a younger man. So far, Pastor Marquardt. You know that last statement, I'm no longer sure which is which and who is who. That expresses the thoughts of the owner who, when asked by the slaves, do you want us to go and gather the weeds? The answer is an emphatic no. The owner's solution is to concentrate on the wheat, on what is good. Keep your attention on the wheat's growth. Be patient with others until the harvest. Be also patient with yourself until God makes the final determination. Now that is not saying that we should be inactive and unconcerned about the weeds in others' lives and in our own. It is not to advise us to be lax about issues of good and evil. It is, however, counseling us to leave judgments to God. The weed of the parable, William Barclay says, was called a darnel. Darnel. It was a well-known a weed in, in Bible times. It looked so much like wheat in its early stages of growing that even the rabbis called it a perverted wheat or a counterfeit wheat, even though it was pure weed. When both the wheat and the weeds had headed out, it was easy to distinguish between them. But by that time, the roots of the wheat and the seeds were so intertwined that no one, that, that, that one could not be pulled up without tearing up the other. So to rip the weeds up would be also to destroy the growth of the wheat. And the parable is seriously asking us if we can clearly determine who is good and who is evil. And the answer comes that we should withhold that judgment. Withhold that judgment. And here's a little story that speaks to that truth. Dobie Gadian, a school teacher for 13 years, decided to travel across America and see the sites she had taught about. Traveling alone in a truck with a camper in tow, she launched out, and one afternoon rounding a curve on, on I-5 near Sacramento in rush hour traffic, a water plump drew blue on her truck. She was tired, exasperated, scared, and alone. In spite of the traffic jam she caused, no one seemed interested in helping. Leaning up against the trailer, she prayed, please God, send me an angel, preferably one with mechanical experience. Within four minutes, a huge Harley drove up, ridden by an enormous man sporting long black hair, a beard, and tattooed arms. With an incredible air of confidence, he jumped off and without even glancing at Doty, went to work on the truck. Within another few minutes, he flagged down a larger truck, attached a choke chain to the frame of the disabled Chevy, and whisked the whole 50-foot, 56-foot uh, rig off the freeway onto a side street, where he calmly continued to work on the water pump. 
The intimidated school teacher was too dumbfounded to talk, especially when she read the paralyzing words on the back of his leather jacket. Hell's Angels, California. As he finished the task, she finally got up the courage to say, thanks so much, and carry on a brief conversation. Noticing her surprise at the whole ordeal, he looked at her straight in the eye and mumbled, don't judge a book by its cover. You may not know who you're talking to. And with that, he smiled, closed the hood of the truck, straddled his Harley, and with a wave, he was gone as fast as he had appeared. In his commentary on this story, Pastor Jorge Perez, who is a pastor in Miami, Florida, says this. Some people have a bad habit of crawling out of the boxes we put them into. Just when we think we have them labeled right, they do something to prove us wrong. I'm just as guilty as anyone of placing motives and attaching blame based on the little information I have. And I'm sure others have been quick to do the same with me. But that's a shallow way to live and an unhealthy pattern to get into. God does not judge by external appearances, Paul tells us in Galatians 2. And neither should we. People deserve the benefit of our doubt. And we deserve the benefit of theirs. And so far, Pastor Perez. That's a good way of stating the final truth of this parable about pulling weeds. The only person with the right to judge is God. It is God alone who can discern the good and the bad. It is God alone who sees all of a person and a person's life. It is God alone who can judge. Shall we gather to pull the weeds? No. Let's wait with faith the harvest, which is God's. Amen. We continue with hymn number 234 and let us stand. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. 
O oh God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and, to tr and truth both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You brought forth all creation and called it good. Direct policymakers to protect lands and seas, bring rain to sun-parched fields, and protect areas impacted by natural disasters. We especially pray today for the western states that are suffering from dangerously high temperatures. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction. We especially pray today for Richard and Gary, Lisa, Gary, Kim, Jan, Sarah, and all those that we name in our hearts. Provide shelter for all who are unhoused and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You name each of us as your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all our education ministry to equip us for faithful living, and our social ministry to enact the gospel in our community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Be with all who grieve the loss of loved ones this day and bring hope in the midst of despair. We remember today the family and friends of Linda Merrill, and we remember the family and friends of Sandy Hotelling. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with one another. You may be seated. We will now receive the offering, and I invite you to fill out the welcome card and place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, for supper, he took the cup, and when given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. You may be seated. If there are any who are receiving the prepared elements in the pews, I would invite you to make them ready at this time. And when you have done so, take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ. Body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given.
now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is the dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. We sing hymn number 261. Go in peace. Share the harvest. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.